My name is Ian Mitchell. I'm uh, one of the emergency physicians in town. That's my main job. Um, but uh, kind of years ago, when I was on my way to medical school, I um, was trying to get into physiology as a prelude to medical school, and uh, my grades weren't good enough. And I ended up um, looking around for something else to do. And this was a day when you just kind of walked around. You, there was no application process. And uh, the guys at physiology said, well, why don't you talk to these guys in pharmacology? And I'm like, well, what's that? I, I, I didn't even know what the word meant. And uh, I said, well, that's where you study the effects of drugs on people. And I'm like, you can do that? <laughs> so, and that was kind of my, my life from there on in. So I've always been very fascinated with drugs, and particularly a lot of the recreational drugs. And um, so when Florian asked me to come and speak here, uh, I was like, well, I'm not an oncologist. I don't have any kind of cancer expertise, but I do know a lot about drugs. And uh, so these are a couple of the drugs that are kind of up and coming in cancer care, and I hope I can just share some information for you. Okay, next slide, please. So a little bit more about me. I'm an emergency physician, as I said, uh, currently at uh, Royal Inland, uh, but I spent a lot of time at St. Paul serving the downtown east side community and a couple of years in Abu Dhabi. And Knowing a lot about drugs, that was kind of handy when cannabis became legalized and kind of went through the medical program, and I participated in some research in that. And along with Michael Cohen, we uh, have a clinic in town here that we help uh, uh, people with issues and uh, around medical cannabis. Uh, I was also the physician lead for the first uh, emergency department take-home naloxone project in Canada, where someone who'd come in with an overdose could leave with a naloxone kit. And now we kind of think that's pretty standard now, and there's kits everywhere but this was actually the, the first uh, place in Canada to do this. And uh, I've had about 28 years of clinical practice with ketamine, so ketamine for sure I can tell you lots about. Next slide, please. Um, as far as conflicts of interest, uh, I'm on the board of directors of CATA Canada, uh, and this is a nonprofit agency that's devoted to uh, moving ketamine out of the hospital into more of the community setting and making it more accessible to people. Um, and I'm also a consultant educator, or have been a consultant educator with Atma Canada, which is a, a company in uh, Alberta that does psychedelic training and research. Uh, I'm no longer affiliated with them at the moment. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with ketamine. And ketamine is the favorite drug of emergency physicians. Um, it, despite being a, a potential drug of abuse, it has stayed in the medical system predominantly because of the military. Uh, because it's an essential drug for the military to use. It's an excellent anesthetic in low resource environments. Uh, so if you're in the third world anywhere, you need to cut off someone's leg, you can give that to them. It doesn't decrease the respiration, doesn't decrease their blood pressure, and, and surgeries can be can uh, carried out. So it's an essential medication for, from the WHO. But it's great for us because um, it is super safe. It is the choice of sedation for little kids to the biggest people there are. Um, we use it to intubate trauma patients because it doesn't decrease the blood pressure. Uh, we use it for procedural sedation across the board. If I'm going to fix a fracture, do a prolonged uh, stitching session. Um, it decreases seizure. It helps asthma. It has so many uses. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great medication, but I really want to talk to it more about uh, in cancer use. Just a little bit about the basics of ketamine. Uh, ketamine is, as I said, a general anesthetic, but at lower doses, it's very good for helping relieve pain. Um, it works on the NMDA system, which is kind of similar to the dopamine system, the epinephrine system. Every, every um, system uh, has a kind of a chemical that activates it, and it, it's, for ketamine, it's the NMDA receptors. One of the limiting factors, it has a kind of short half-life, only lasts for about an hour. So, if, you know, even if you give it by mouth, it's only going to last an hour or two. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to give ongoing. Uh, it's much better if you can give it IV or subcutaneous. Um, uh, oral dosing is possible, but uh, it tastes bad and it, it um, leads to kind of more ataxia. People feel a bit more off offset with it. One of the things that people may be familiar with is a medication called S-ketamine. And that's a kind of one isomer of ketamine that's been uh, isolated and marketed for depression. So right now you can go to a psychiatrist's office and get S-ketamine uh, nasally for depression. There's only certain psychiatrists that have um, uh, been approved to do that by the company. When we talk about ketamine and cancer, um, it's useful for pain management. So it can be given orally or intranasally, but really ideally you're giving a, a longer subcutaneous infusion or an intravenous infusion. Um, it's useful as antidepressant, and that can be more intermittent use. So that can be a use that's every couple of days, once a week, 
It can be very effective as an antidepressant in a way that traditional antidepressants are not. Um, traditional antidepressants, all the SSRIs, the tricyclic antidepressants, they take about three to four weeks to become effective when, from the time you start them. Whereas ketamine is within hours. And the only other thing that does that is electroconvulsive therapy. And that obviously comes with its own issues. And interestingly, just yesterday, uh, there's a, a big physician's resource called Up to Date, and it kind of contains all the medical information. It's usually what I go to when I'm looking for, I don't know what to do in this case. And uh, that happens often enough in eMERGE. Um, and they just changed their guidelines yesterday to say that ketamine was a better choice than electroconvulsive therapy, which is a kind of a major shift in psychiatry. Um, one of the things that can happen with opiates, if you take them for a long time, not even that long, even after about a week, people become tolerant, but they also develop hyperanalgesia. So they will perceive pain as being more intense because of the effect of the opiates. And this effect is mediated by NMDA receptors, and it can be blocked by ketamine. So with ketamine, you can reset that hyperalgesia, and you can provide some pain relief on its own, and you can decrease the amount of opiates that need to be given. And those are all kind of good things in cancer care. Certainly in the emergency department, I see many people with uh, issues with opiates. Too much sedation, too much constipation, respiratory depression, all big issues. So by introducing ketamine, often we can decrease the amount of opiates that are being used. And this is um, just kind of one example of a trial. This is a relatively recent trial that happened in Toronto. I just like to showcase Canadian research when possible. Uh, and this kind of adds to our knowledge of the, of the subject. This is actually the first um, psilocybin trial performed in Canada. Um, and it was 20 people. Uh, it's the inked PC trial, so intranasal ketamine for depression in people with cancer in palliative care. Okay. So all these patients with palliative care due to cancer, and they all have depression. And they were given ketamine up to three doses over one week intranasally. And that's usually a dose of about 50 to 75 milligrams. And they were allowed to redose if their symptoms recurred. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. And this is just kind of an example. What we see here is really within days, you know, one, two days, all of a sudden, depression is, is much better. Okay? And that's just not something that we see with traditional antidepressants. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the issues are that this is an incredibly difficult medication to access. I can use it in the emergency department. But if I've got someone who's doing great on a low dose of ketamine, zero side effects, I can't send them up the floor because they won't run on the floor. So then that just goes away for them, and that's unfortunate. Um, intranasal is great, but it's, it, you're kind of limited in how, uh, how much you can give. And if you're using it for pain, you've got to kind of keep redosing, and that's not really ideal. Uh, oral dosing, as I mentioned before, kind of increases some of the ataxia. And ultimately, it is a psychedelic, and not everybody's cool with that. That's something you have to kind of talk to, to people about. And, you know, for me, it's a, it's a different matter. It's like, well, you're going to sleep now, boom, away you go. But uh, this is a different matter where you keep people awake, and like, okay, if they start to get into that psychedelic range and start seeing walls melting and that sort of stuff, that can be kind of distressing for people. Kids love it. Yeah, it's like Barney coming out of the wall. Yeah, this is great. All right. Um, so that's pretty much ketamine. Um, so I'd love to see it more used in, in ketamine. There's uh, some good research uh, and review articles on it. And uh, I hope that kind of this has um, been a little bit informational about ketamine. Next slide, please. So next we're going to move on to psilocybin. The psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. So we're talking about essentially a psychedelic. But it's really uh, coming up on its own now as a medication for depression. And again, it's, um, yeah, next slide, please. Again, this is uh, something that acts very quickly, much quicker than traditional antidepressants, and has a prolonged duration of action to six months for these treatments. So we really started, um, cancer is, end of life anxiety in cancer is kind of a, a wedge that's been used for psilocybin. We want to study this drug. And in, in, for cannabis, it was kids with seizures. There's kids with seizures that, you know, you can only get them better with CBD. And that's a terrible thing to have. It gets a seizure. So it's hard for an agency to stand up and say, well, we're not going to approve this trial to treat kids with seizures. So we've got no other option. And then so now with psilocybin, we've got, okay, well, now it's okay to experiment on people at the end of life. 
but you can't have it pretty much for anything else. But at end of life, they're, they're kind of reasonable, a little bit more reasonable about it. So there were initially a couple of pilot studies in 2011, just small numbers. In 2016, there were two randomized controlled trials at John Hopkins and NYU. So very major academic centers are coming into this now. And this is for relief of existential distress, about dying, uh, coming to terms with, with that. And ultimately, they found this is very successful at relieving these symptoms. And that um, the people who benefit most have a true mystical experience uh, during, during their session. And if you don't have that experience, you may not get as much benefit. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this uh, study that came out uh, last week, Canadian study, and uh, this is kind of adding into the, the research that we have. Uh, so, I'm oh, sorry, I, I was talking about uh, psilocybin. This is the first psilocybin study in, in Canada. Um, and it was 21 patients. Uh, they included some more severe patients than normally get into these studies with major depressive dis uh, disorder and bipolar disorder. Often bipolar patients are excluded from these studies. Uh, they used between one and three doses of uh, psilocybin and they allowed for re repeated dose uh, if there was relapse. And this was very successful uh, as far as uh, treating their depression. And just kind of paint a little bit of a picture about what this is, because it's like, what are you doing? What, you just give these people when they're tripping out? What? No, this is a very controlled environment. So under research protocols and, and clinical situations, people will generally have a couple of counseling sessions prior to the experience. When they have the psychedelic experience, there will be two sitters present, generally a male and a female. Um, the typical dose that's given is about 25 milligrams, uh, and that's equivalent to about three grams of dried mushrooms. And that'll produce a psychedelic effect of around six hours. So you got these two sitters, patient there, often there's music playing, classical kind of stuff. Um, patient may have blindfolds, um, headphones uh, on, and there's two sitters, and they may interact or may not. Um, and this goes for about six hours, and you can see here already how this is difficult research. You know, you've got two people monitoring them the whole time for six hours. Good reason why we don't do LSD research, because it takes 12 hours for people to come around. You know, everybody's sitting around just waiting for them to, to sober up. Oh, we've got to get, close up the lab. So it's really, you know, uh, psilocybin is the, is the way to go. Um, so really what they find is that it's got a similar effect to escitalopram. That was one study, which is one of our traditional SSRIs. Um, interestingly, if you're on SSRIs, you're unlikely to get benefit from the psilocybin. It really tends to, to dampen the um, experience, so people often have to, to um, taper off a bit before they do a psilocybin session. And next slide, please. Um, right now in Canada, there are 69 sources that are approved to produce psilocybin. They're producing it for the Special Access Program, and they're producing it for research trials around the world. Um, Currently in Canada, you can access psilocybin as a patient only through trials or through the special access program. Um, and that can be difficult. Um, there's only been 176 Canadians approved to use psilocybin since February of 2022. Um, they approve about three quarters of their applications, but you know, if you had one application that went through, the second one might not. You're depressed again. And right now, there are 36 clinical psilocybin trials approved in Canada. Next slide, please. Uh, issues with this therapy. Overall, the medical side effects are uncommon. A um, uh, couple years back, there's a guy who's trying to get me to start up a psilocybin clinic. I don't know what a doctor would do there because there's not much, much big issues. As long as you don't have big uh, issues with psychosis, generally there's not going to be any issues. But it's very expensive. It's very time consuming. You know, we talked about those a couple sessions before then the, the experience, then a, a reintegration session after. So all these counseling sessions, people, it's huge amounts of time and it's huge amounts of money. So if you're um, doing psychedelic therapy, often it's going to cost you know, thousands of dollars. Uh, special access program, they may or may not approve your application. There's no real kind of guidance, so it, it can be quite capricious. Another issue is there's kind of a lack of representation. Most people involved in the psychedelic field look like me. Okay, and that's the, a product of the patriarchy. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's how things are, but there's, you know, it's like the mushrooms, they came from indigenous people, and that's not always reflected in uh, what the kind of experience. Um, you also need to look at the role of ritual. You know, a lot of the indigenous people would have rituals that would associate the taking of these substances, and we're just giving it. You know, is there, a, a, you know, more help with, with a ritual being present? 
And there's the stigma of the psychedelic experience. A lot of big pharma companies are trying to uh, come up with something that'll hit those receptors but not cause psychedelic experience. But it kind of seems that like psychedelic experience is kind of what is needed to make this work. So it's kind of up and down. And uh, as always, there's problems with big pharma and in, uh, intellectual property, and they're always trying to um, uh, uh, copyright all kinds of things and products as part of this. All right, uh, next slide. Last, I will leave you with resources. Uh, just an article from the CBC and a couple of articles that you may find interesting. And uh, the kind of local uh, psilocybin agency is Therapsil. Uh, they're on Vancouver Island. Uh, so they have a website and lots of interesting stuff to check out there. Thank you so much. Um, and that's the end of my talk. <laughs>
is an introspective and reflexive process by which nurses and other healthcare professionals will explore their biases, their attitudes, and their stereotypes. Cultural safety is something that needs to be uh, introspectively examined in order to see the quali how it can affect. If I lack cultural safety, then it will affect the way that I'm delivering care to the patient. So it's a reflexive practice. It supports critical examination especially of power imbalance that we know occur within all, not only society, but also within the healthcare system as we know it. And culture, when we talk about cultural safety, we also introduce the concept of social justice, especially addressing the health inequities that, that affects people in our, in, in globally and locally in our healthcare system. And it also talks about the process of othering, especially othering means marginalization. Uh, that could be social marginalization, that could be cultural uh, marginalization or racialization. So these are process that really relates. And it's very difficult to dissociate cultural safety, which even if different, from cultural competency, they, they, they complement each other and needs to be present if we want to uh, provide culturally competent and safe care. And for that particular research, we'll be using both post-colonial and intersectionality theory. Now, why are we doing that? So here uh, I'm providing, I guess that everyone knows about that, breast cancer in the world and in Canada it's uh, breast cancer is the second most common cancer and one of the leading cause of cancer mortality around the world. It's also one that benefits from early detection and has very good outcome if we can uh, detect it early and screen it early. Breast cancer is also the first cause of cancer among Canadian women and the second cause of mortality. 5,400 deaths related to breast cancer occurred in Canada in 2023 among females, but when properly diagnosed and treated, the life expectancy of five years, five year survival rate and life expectancy is longer, and it could be at a benefit 89% of the women. Yet, Despite this advancement in our society about breast cancer and the decrease in this incidence and mortality rate, there is a dirt of knowledge about refugee women and how they deal with breast cancer. So um, there is uh, our, our our study focus on Muslim immigrant Muslim refugee women, not immigrant, because. Uh, there are some epidemiological risks that let us uh, believe and assume that uh, this particular group of the population, these women coming from uh, war-torn country, from refugee camps, could be at higher risk of, risk of vulnerability. So uh, this is where cultural safety and cultural competency intersect with the breast cancer uh, issue and especially among refugee women. If we look at some epidemiological data, uh, there was a, um, a survey in 22 Arab countries that revealed a high, a high uh, rate of uh, high incidence rate of breast cancer. And I won't go into detail about that survey. And some other studies also uh, describe low screening rates among uh, Muslim native and also refugee women that had been documented in the Gulf country, in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and other countries in the Muslim world. So there's a low participation also in breast awareness activities uh, that raise specific concern, especially among Syrian and Iraqi refugee women. And this is mostly those study coming from the Arab world. And the other concern is that most of the women who have been diagnosed in these countries uh, present early onset of the disease and especially, and also are diagnosed at a later stage of the illness, which really compromise uh, their survival rate compared to Western European and North American women. 
And the other thing that uh, pushes us to explore this, uh, this problematic is the fact that uh, being the refugee status intersect and create adds more complexity to the problem, especially the fact that there has been experience of traumatic experience, war experience, also lots of displacement, displacement, forced migration, and issues of gender disparity means that being a refugee woman increases the risk, especially if we think about, for our case, uh, about breast cancer. So uh, this is what we have in terms of our, our net review. So uh, we have submitted uh, and we're happy to be funded by SURE to do a, a, a study to capture the interplay between race, gender norms and role, Islamic faith and refugee status, and how these factors can really affect or influence or intersect with the social context of resettlement in Canada to influence breast awareness among uh, this particular group of women. And we know that Muslim refugee women are currently underrepresented both, both globally and in Canada in health studies, especially studies related to health disparities. So our objective, we want to understand gender norms, we want to understand the roles and the cultural beliefs and the social structures that may affect women's perspective. And on top of that, if we see something, then if we there are barriers, we want to develop a culturally sensitive and faith positive message to increase breast awareness. So the results are likely to influence um, attitudes and, and provide women with informed decision related to their breast health. And our research questions are quite straightforward. So we look at, again, how do gender relation and social structures affect a refugee woman understanding and performance of breast awareness activities? And what could be uh, the cultural and faith-related barriers that may impact women's participation in breast awareness activities or screening programs? We'll be using the intersectionality theory, and I won't go that much into explaining why, but it's really for us to see that gender and other social factor may act as structural barrier. There are issues of power relation, and we really want to use that lens in order to, to provide the in-depth examination of where these factors may interact to create uh, or to sustain health inequities. So that's a critical analysis of uh, breast awareness among refugee uh, women that we will uh, undertake. As for the methodology and the methods, it's a, for the moment we, we need to know more about the topic. So we are doing a qualitative exploratory research. We have a sample of 30 uh, Muslim uh, Arab uh, refugee women. And one part, half of the study is being conducted in BC and the other half here in Saskatchewan. And we are conducting individual interview. The, the study has started both in BC and in Saskatchewan. Why we do intellect, individual interviews with women? Because we want to know their perspective and their beliefs about breast cancer, about screening and um, know what could be the gender role that may affect their choice in terms of, uh, of, of being screened or not, or, or their beliefs. And we also want to contextualize, to provide a context to the, these, these beliefs and their, their perspective within the social, cultural, and gendered environment, which may affect health uh, promoting behavior or not, or not. So we don't have the answer for that. Uh, we will also have focus groups, one with male and one with females, because we uh, know that from lit review and from past experience with research, that it's important to interview both males and females. For the focus groups interview, we will look at what Cohen and Aziza in their cultural uh, scale, they develop some concepts, some dimension like the religious beliefs. We'll look into that. What are the religious beliefs related to cancer and the cure of cancer? What could be the social barriers or especially 
issue of stigma of losing a social status or social roles due to breast cancer, accessibility issues that relates a lot to the resettlement context, which is language, geographic uh, situation, and institutional barrier, how to access the healthcare system. And also we know for exposure barriers can also uh, related to modesty could also uh, become barriers for screening. And it's derived basically from a scale that was developed by Aziza and Cohen. So what could be the expected outcomes, especially the social outcomes of this study? This project will support the development and implementation of culturally safe breast awareness messages grounded in the faith in Islam social and cultural context, because we have seen in the literature that faith can also be a facilitator and not uh, we, we, we should not see that as a barrier, but also as a facilitator uh, to push women to go into a screening. The findings also will contribute to culturally competent safe uh, policies related to healthcare and cancer prevention, especially when we look at refugee women and refugee study. We don't have a lot of that. There's some in the United States and uh, in other uh, receiving countries like Norway, uh, there's also a receiving country like Turkey are more advanced than us. The findings will promote also women's education and create their condition of empowerment for the women to be able to uh, make the decision and to uh, look after their wellness and uh, their health. And also it's interesting to build intergenerational community capacity to empower women and to create the social and professional support where women will benefit uh, from knowledge and will uh, develop their own community knowledge support to access better care and to uh, provide a better health outcome for breast cancer. So uh, I am privileged to work with such a great team from Thompson River University and also from the University of Victoria and our own people here from the University of Saskatchewan. So uh, I've provided a list of reference, uh, but it's, uh, if you need more reference, uh, that's, that's okay. But this is most of the reference that I have for this presentation. And I thank you for uh, your attention and for listening to this presentation. I'm honored to now invite Michael Cohen, founder and director of clinical services, CanSol, and president of Mind Team's Mental Health Solutions, to address you on a topic that delves into the realms of possibility, innovation, an alternative cancer care therapy. Well, hello, everybody. Let's talk about cannabis. Uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to reach out to our community. Uh, this is very, very exciting for me to be here. Next slide, please. So I just want to welcome both everybody here locally in the Kamloops region and for anybody who's connecting uh, remotely who might be in another country or another part of our country, uh, welcome to Kamloops and welcome to our home. That's very exciting. And I'd just like to acknowledge that we are on uh, the unceded territory of the Sequetmic Nation and I'm grateful for our opportunity today to be able to gather here and share uh, of our knowledge and our experiences. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I work within industry and I am the person who is going to industry saying things are too expensive. There are too many barriers to access. The rules are too restrictive. It is too difficult for people to access the help and the care that they need. And my way of addressing this is to actually become a licensed producer of cannabis, work within the industry, and work towards the very first social licensed producer of cannabis that is focused on people and not profit. So as I walk into this, and as you see that I work with all of these cannabis companies, I do so to encourage the system to change and improve for the sake of patients and people in need and their families. Uh, next slide, please. So um, very briefly about myself, um, I am a self-taught cannabis clinician. As we've talked a little bit about knowledge transfer in the area of actual medical cannabis uh, being used strategically and intentionally, there is a huge lack of ability to get formal training 
to get practical training, to be able to work within a clinic to help people and families to know just what to do, how to do it, taking out a lot of the confusion and making this a practical kind of thing to do. And so my work in particular here in Kamloops, anybody who knows the Welcome Back MRI and Pain Management Center downtown, I was one of the co-founders of that center. I'm the owner of the CanSolve Clinic. I work with Dr. Ian Mitchell, a wonderful colleague, an incredible man uh, who has given a tremendous amount to our community. I'm very thankful uh, to be able to work with him. I'm trained as a registered clinical counselor. Uh, I work particularly in the areas where uh, there is very high need and very high cost. So I am often the practitioner of last resort after a motor vehicle accident, workplace accident, serious uh, disease process where we've exhausted a lot of traditional types of things. And here we are going to the cannabis clinic. And so when you arrive, my goal is to assist you through that entire process. Uh, next slide, please. So very simple, my mission, I want to improve our world by helping people who suffer to thrive. The key word being thrive. I am excited to be able to do uh, clinical research and practical clinical work that not only focuses on just helping people get by, but people matter, the families matter, people's hopes and dreams and desires matter, and we must align with that. So I work on thriving. So as a clinical researcher, I'm very grateful to have a partnership uh, in doing some clinical research with TRU and UBC Okanagan uh, through some incredible people. Uh, I'd like to very much so thank Dr. Florian Fair for being a person to stand up and create something from nothing in the cannabis uh, world here in Kamloops and particularly at this institution. She is an amazing human being pushing forth great research, great teams, great collaboration, uh, everything that is in the spirit of today. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, uh, Dr. Carolyn McCallum, who I've done some uh, work in, in uh, education and research with, and some of her work you will see today. So I just want to make sure I thank her for her contributions and collaboration with me. Next slide, please. All right, let's go over some objectives really quickly. I want you to have a knowledge transfer experience today while we talk through this. And I'm going to do so by sharing what patients have taught me so I can pass this along to you. It's coming from the front lines. It's coming from people that are doing this to make it very practical. And so we're learning from the people that know. And in doing so in our work, we say we need to simplify all of this. Well, how do we do it? One of the things is telling you about what we call the three yes rule. So very quickly and easily, you can define treatment success from the point of view of the patient, and you can apply the same strategy you learn here today to any therapy, to any intervention. And we're gonna talk a little bit as well about clinical best practices, how they are assistive, how they can support, but also to ensure that we have the balance in saying, I am not presenting a cure-all here today, I'm certainly not saying cannabis alone is necessarily going to be enough to produce the desired results, but it is extremely important that we see what we can do. And I also want to inspire some curiosity, perhaps for people that may think, cannabis, I'm not so sure about all of that, and I don't really want to put myself, even dip a toe maybe into that. But I'd like to inspire some curiosity and thoughtful discussion about how this may be useful in helping patients with, with any needs. And today specifically, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about cancer. Next slide, please. So very quickly, we're going to talk about how patients are uh, using medical cannabis to achieve their outcomes. A little brief review of some important literature that I think may be helpful for people that are interested in learning more about this. And then we'll open up uh, an opportunity for dialogue. If we have time for questions, great. If not, I'll be next door through the lunch break and everything. I'll be here for the rest of the day. Please come see me and talk. I would love to chat with you. Next slide, please. So we learn best in change from hearing stories that strike a chord within us. And so I would like to tell you very briefly about a very important story, next slide please, um, occurring right here in our community. And part of the reason why I really wanna thank Florian uh, for her incredible work that she's done here is she helped to form a team, including Dr. Mitchell, uh, Dr. McCallum, uh, Dr. Malloy, uh, Dr. Walsh, uh, Bob Hughes, some amazing people that have all joined together on an advisory board to start a study of the first of its kind in the world of embedding a medical cannabis clinic into a supported recovery facility for helping to tackle the overdose crisis. So people coming out of the toxic drug supply into supported housing, into detox, into physician support, medication supplied to this with as little barrier as possible to try new minimally to non-impairing cannabinoid formulas. 
We're not taking people from drugs and making them high. We are taking people and applying chemical formulas that do jobs. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so right here in town, we started what we called the Maverick Study. And through it, we have people who have come from the streets, stabilized, experienced their own improvements, share that knowledge. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we can transfer that knowledge to cancer care. And the reason being is folks that have come off the streets out of the toxic drug supply have every psychological, every physical, every psychosocial, every possible symptom we could imagine, including cancer. And they show up all at once with all of those things. So they're incredible teachers, lots and lots of things they can teach us. Next slide, please. All right, so one of the very first most important lessons we learned right off the bat is about something called agenda alignment, which is where, you know, as practitioners, we all want to come in and do what we can to help. But what does help mean? And each particular patient and their families all have an agenda around what is important to them. And by identifying from the very beginning what matters to the person in front of you, you can then build every intervention, support, and resource you want to bring once you know how it serves. As opposed to saying, I think this will serve. Please teach me from your perspective first about what would serve. And so agenda alignment is our first tool to take away. And from a psychological perspective, when people are agenda aligned, it actually really eliminates resistance because it's patient led, patient centered. So when a patient thinks, hey, you've got this, you understand me, then they can say, let's go. And from both a resource standpoint and an efficacy standpoint, we'll use less resources and have better outcomes if we start with agenda alignment. So checking in with the patient, finding out how we can help them. Next slide, please. So interestingly enough, uh, Dr. McCallum in some of her research said, you know, well, why do patients actually even come to the medical cannabis clinic? What are they looking for? Well, they want to improve quality of life, function. They want to have their, their pain medications work better, sleep, mood, anxiety, and they want to be able to have a reduction in medications that may have some help, but they also may have some side effect burden that can affect a person's quality of life. And so what's sort of interesting in these patient treatment goals here, we're actually not specifically looking at cancer, but again, the transference is absolutely one-to-one -one for what we're looking at. So it's interesting that the work we do in one can apply to another. Next slide, please. The next thing we learned is to be informed. And to everyone's credit who's here today, who is actually becoming informed, way to go. This is our second tool that's so important. And when a patient understands that you are informed and you're informed from trusted sources, as opposed to in the medical cannabis industry, we have a huge legacy and history of stigma and distortion and not necessarily as much an evidence basis, but very much a cultural bias that has emerged from uh, history with this. And so if we go by bias and we go by history, we may either ignore or downplay the potential role for something that could serve. So I encourage all of us here today to look at cannabis as a tool, no different than any other tool we would consider. And that's extremely important for those families and patients that find that this tool is useful. When there is stigma attached, it creates a shame, a guilt, a blame, a judgment, which certainly no patient needs or deserves. Okay, next slide, please. So being informed often starts at the basics here. And don't worry about knowing all of this, but what I want to impart about you is that cannabis is not one thing. Cannabis is a rainbow. And it's like picking a color out of it and saying, I know the rainbow, see, red. No, no, but what about the rest of the rainbow? No, no, I have it. It's one color. And so in cannabis, we largely break it down into a major and minor cannabinoids. Lots of people know about THC and CBD, but in fact, the plant has over 500 active compounds that interact with human health in a variety of very interesting and very useful ways. So the first thing I want to do is just break that barrier saying that, you know, cannabis is we smoke a joint and we get high. And I would argue that in fact, you know, that view of cannabis has done more harm to prevent people from seeking out the tool set. Because in fact, the vast majority of the work we do is not that old school smoking high impairment aspect of this. It is utility cannabis, which is what tool, what job. So next slide, please. 
And I want to particularly, for people who haven't heard of this, there are three major categories of cannabis where you'll find the compounds. Raw, heated, and aged. So we can talk more about them in just a sec here. Next slide. Um, patients reported improving results using non-impairing cannabis tools, including what are called the acid forms of cannabinoids. We know THC and CBD, but, next slide please, have we heard of CBDA? THCA? Well, if you kept the plant raw, and those are my pictures, by the way, that's me making a raw shake with this. And in our work, we're finding that the plant is far more complex than we ever imagined. And the jobs that we can harness this plant to do involve going back to nature, having less human processing and involvement, and then seeking to understand the utility of those tools. Again, minimally to non-impairing oral preparations are the mainstay of treatment. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, we have what we call the activated or heated forms of cannabis. So we have people that use a CBD topical or a THC topical. We have oral oils of CBD, THC, and other compounds. And we have, of course, the old school way where people will still um, consume by uh, inhalation, though we use vaporization as opposed to combustion. We don't want patients burning if we can get them vaporizing uh, for that sort of thing. Next slide, please. And there is a new category, which is interesting, in the minor cannabinoids that are the aged cannabinoids. So a plant that is left to its own devices will actually completely chemically change from when it was fresh to when it's aged. And in doing so, we have new compounds. We have CBN, for example, which a lot of people are interested to understand how can these tools serve in our needs. Again, oral preparations, and they're through the whole uh, marketplace here more and more. Um, CBG, uh, THCV being a couple of the other ones that we really want to mention. Next. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the three yes rule and how we define success here. And so clear and understandable criteria for treatment success. Next slide, please. And so from uh, Dr. McCallum's literature, uh, back in, in 2018, she did an amazing paper with Dr. Uh, Ethan Russo. And they talked about um, the clinical usage of cannabis, which is very limited in the literature. So medical cannabis patients, in contrast to the recreational users, are frequently using what they call the CBD predominant chemovars, which means non-impairing, something that is going to assist with treatments, but isn't going to take away function. So they want to have their symptom control, function and quality of life measures to improve. One, two, three, with the fewest number of adverse events. Okay, next slide, please. Treatment success in our work in medical cannabis is defined by the patient saying three yeses or three no's. Three yeses are required, by the way. There is no, we got two out of three and let's just call it a day. It must be all three. And so in particular, if you were to sit down with a patient and you were to say, okay, we've got a new tool, I'd like you to try this oil. And uh, what I'd like you to report on is if you believe that you're having an improvement in your symptom, whether it's pain, whether it's anxiety, uh, whether it's sleep, I wanna know, first of all, do you have in increased control over that symptom group that you're working with? Great, if we have a yes, fantastic, we're on the right track. Next, I wanna know that you have an improved function. If you get those benefits, but you're completely sedated and unable to participate in the things you want to do, not okay. We're not there. So if we get a yes to function, I'm getting all the benefits, I still function, then I ask, well, how is your quality of life with those two factors happening? How are we doing? Yes to the third one, fantastic. We're on the right track, lock it down, let's get going from here. And so we've taken thousands and thousands of medical cannabis products and the colors of the rainbow, and we've gone here, 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 lock it down. There you are, three yeses or noes. Now look, you could substitute cannabis with yoga. You could substitute cannabis with mindfulness. It's really fine to use the exact three-part formula to ask about any treatment, and then patients get that you get it. And they're like, we're connected, we're agenda aligned. You understand me because you're speaking my language and the resistance melts, because now we're there. All right, next thing we learned here is match the treatment to the need. So are we going to talk about a as needed kind of approach or are we talking about 24 seven continuous care? Quite often that's what we are looking at when we talk about cancer therapy is we have symptoms that may be uh, present in the daytime, in the nighttime, they may be predictable, they may be unpredictable. 
And so in our work, again, oral preparations that are minimally to non-impairing are the mainstay of treatment. We have a daytime focus with very strong um, uh, emphasis on, on people being able to function without being sedated. And during the nighttime, we may see a sedation side effect as actually a clinically desired benefit. But we need to make sure that people are educated, they know what to use, when to use it, and I've matched it to your needs so that you get it. At nighttime, you want to rest and sleep, and you're okay with feeling sedated, but not during the daytime, because you have things to do. And when we align, it becomes clear how we use the medication. So match to the patient's needs 24-7 with some as needed uh, if people have a breakthrough and need control. Next slide, please. So again, uh, chronic conditions, there we are. Um, right out of the literature, we are going to be using the oral preparations. Inhalation is available, uh, similar as a PRN uh, in any medication, so people can use inhaled formats. Again, vaporization is the preferred format for that, and the minimally to non-impairing formulations in the inhalation therapy. We match that both oral and inhaled. CBD is one of these cannabinoids that can be useful to act as a bit of a break, a bit of a drag shoot, and it can limit the potential for people to experience too much impairment or intoxication and help provide some balance. Buffer agents like CBD, THCA, and CBD can be very useful in helping patients to feel comfortable and in control of their cannabis experience through the entire, uh, whether they're brand new or they're seasoned users. Next slide, please. And so I, I think it was really, really valuable. Um, Colleen was mentioning um, in her great presentation earlier here today about the things she likes to do. She said, hey, I'm an avid cyclist. You know, I like to get out and I like to do things. And so when we ask the question, is cannabis alone enough? Next slide, please. We need to talk a little bit about how we can answer that question. So in our work, we look at what we call the think, can, do formula. The first is we have to start with the end in mind. So we identify the patient agenda, the agenda alignment, and we let them know, compliance, you're going to need to use this if it's going to work. Consistency, you're going to need to use it on a regular basis. Okay, and commitment, we're going to need to hold the course on cannabis. And if we do, then we will be able to realize the best benefits. And if not, we're not likely to get it if we just dip our toe into it. All right, the can part is, what are you actually going to use? It's like you're hiring for a job. Don't think about cannabis as cannabis. Think about it as, I'm hiring you for this symptom, for this job, for this time of day. I'm hiring you for this, then I put you on probation and I test. Does it meet the three yeses? And if it does, you're hired. Welcome to the team. And if I try those particular cannabis and I go, whoa, that is not the right fit for me, does not pass probation, fired, on to the next candidate. And once we have this ability to assemble a team that works for you, they are now something you can lock down and keep relatively consistent because with cannabis, we don't typically see huge changes in dosing. Once we've arrived where we are, it's typically very, very stable. But extremely important to focus on the third part of this, which is the do. So with cannabis, it's always about adding something plus to the cannabis, big or small, whatever it is within the person's own world that matters to them. Symptom improvement and increased quality of life comes from doing. So whether that's, uh, like Colleen was saying, going out on that cycling, great. Cannabis can actually support your symptom control to enable you to be more active, whether that's socially, whether that's physically. When we get the formula right, we can support the patient's goals and outcomes. Next slide, please. All right, so let's just tie it all together here in our knowledge transfer. Number one, seek proper advice. So that means that individuals need to have physician guidance and clinical support. Uh, the average person who walks into a cannabis store, which is everywhere, and says, okay, I have uh, cancer and I need uh, uh, symptom support. First thing at the store, they can't help you. If you say, I'm a medical patient and I'm asking for a, a, a cannabis product to treat my symptoms, they whoa, no, 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 no. I can read to you the label. I can tell you what percentage of these things are, but I absolutely cannot give you treatment uh, guidance or advice. When you come to a clinic, similar to like ours, or if you see your family doctor, you can actually speak about matching tools to jobs. You're going through a different path where you are working um, through licensed channels and the physician can actually set up a treatment program for you so you know what to follow, what to do. You're not sifting through thousands of products. You're going, I was told to get this and that and use it like this, which is very medical. 
very utility based in its work. Number two, be informed, be curious about cannabis again, where we say it's different today. It's modern today. It's Health Canada regulated. Labels are mandatory. Lab testing is mandatory. Recall processes. The kinds of things that we can build confidence into a medical channel of products that are uh, safe and effective for us to use, especially when physician guidance uh, is included in that and clinical support. Number three, define success. If we just go into cannabis and we go, all right, let's see what this can do. Uh, the question will be, well, what are we trying to do? Let's determine what success looks like. Next, let's match the uh, treatment to the needs. Is it 24-7? Uh, Is it as needed? Is it both? And lastly, it's extremely important that we remember that cannabis alone is not enough. We need to match this with lifestyle change. We saw some fantastic data here earlier about some of the factors that maybe we can make a difference with. And so I would encourage us to use cannabis as an adjunct, as a tool to traditional pharmacology, in addition to lifestyle change, diet change, and these other factors that are proven to make a difference in cancer care. So uh, a great big thank you uh, to everybody here and especially to the first annual KT World Cafe Summit. A great congratulations to Dr. D'Souza, Dr. Fair, and as I know, you must have a phenomenal team behind you of people we can see in the room today and others who maybe aren't here as well. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, uh, my contact information is on the screen. I've probably gone too long, uh, but if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to. Otherwise, come join me over uh, at the lunch. Thank you. I would like to now invite Jennifer Edgecombe to share with us the support of cancer care at BC Cancer on a list of services. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity. My name is Jen Edgecombe. I work for BC Cancer. I work for a team called Provincial Programs, and the portfolio that I work in is called the Manager of Supportive Care and Patient and Family Experience. And uh, I would, wouldn't be appropriate not to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Indigenous keepers of the traditional and unceded lands where I have the privilege of living, working, and playing situated on the Tecumloop Shishwetmik. And this is one of my favorite views in Kamloops. Um, I think we've all probably, if you live here, you've probably stood in Kenna Cartwright and thought, wow, thanks for letting me call this home. So <clears throat> my presentation goal maybe is a little bit different. Um, I, I'm coming with an agenda. I, 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 I'm hoping we can have a conversation. I'm gonna talk for a little bit, but I'm really hoping that we can have a discussion. So uh, this presentation was co-designed with the Medical Director of Supportive Care, Dr. Alan Bates from BC Cancer, the Executive Director of Professional Practice and the Abbotsford um, Regional Center, Ruby Gitta. And uh, I've been sent to collect some information. So we, we work really closely um, about delivering supportive care services and creating the strategic approach for supportive care across BC. So what we want to know is how can BC Cancer increase awareness amongst clinicians and providers about, and I'm going to say we, we use something called supportive care rounds and we're going to talk about that, but about supportive care. And how can BC Cancer improve uh, knowledge about self-management resources amongst patients and caregivers who are treated at a community oncology network close to their home like Kamloops. And I've put the little star because what's gonna happen with this information is I'm gonna collect the information, I'm gonna, gonna bring it back to some working groups that I'm on at BC Cancer, and we're gonna see what suggestions or input or engagement we can use to take us in a new direction. So it's not necessarily that whatever you ask, we're gonna be able to get, but, um, but that's what the information is going to go to. Thank you. And I'm sure I've heard people mention this before, so I wanted to mention BC's 10-year Cancer Action Plan. So if you're not aware of the Cancer Plan, it's really important that I start with, this is a ministry document. The Ministry of Health developed the 10-year Cancer Action Plan. It was released in January of 2023 and publicated in February of 2023. There are four strategies within the cancer plan. 
prevent and detect cancer, ensure timely access to treatment, work in partnership along the cancer care system. This one's long, but it's basically just system enablers. Get the people, get the right tech in place, get all of those system enablers in place so that we can move forward. And if you haven't read the cancer plan, it's a really short, easy bedtime read. It's only about 85 pages. You'll love it. But it's a really great document, and it can be found here. Next slide. The purpose of this slide is to make sure that there's really clarity in this room about how BC Cancer participates in cancer care in British Columbia. So BC Cancer operates six regional sites. We're in Abbotsford, Surrey, Kelowna's our closest, Prince George, Vancouver, Victoria. At those six sites, we offer assessment, diagnostic services, syst systemic therapy, which is chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiation therapy, and then supportive care. Uh, what we have here in Kamloops is called a community oncology network, and those are all around the province, and they are in partnership, they're delivered in partnership with the health authority to provide chemotherapy, sometimes immunotherapy, closer to home for more British Columbians. So the, this is, it's very important distinction that community oncology networks are in partnership with the health authority. Next slide. This is brilliant. Has anybody ever heard of the Bowtie model? So there is an absolutely brilliant physician at BC Cancer. Her name is Dr. Pippa Howley. She is the medical director for pain and symptom management for, and palliative care. And she saw that linear trajectory of cancer care and immediately got offended by it. Because cancer care for most people is not linear. It's a bit more up and down, we have some curative elements of our therapy options. We have control options or control elements of our therapy options. Sometimes people go into survivorship and rehabilitation. Sometimes people go to hospice towards bereavement. And none of this is linear. But the one thing that is consistent throughout the entire Bowtie model is supportive care. Supportive care is woven throughout. So you can look that up online, it's on our website, it's on the BC Cancer website. I just like these, these, I have completely plagiarized this from the BC Cancer website. I just love the philosophies of supportive care at BC Cancer. To me, it feels really beautiful. Everyone's experience is unique. We want to give each patient and family member a safe place to be heard, appreciated, and accepted. We offer a wide range of programs to help BC Cancer patients manage the physical, emotional, social, practical concerns that come with having a cancer diagnosis and treatment. Again, completely plagiarized. I just really like it. Ah, this is important. The Barrel Institute um, is one of our governing bodies within patient and family experience. And what they say is nothing about us without us. At BC Cancer, we don't make our programs without our end user at the table. So we have patients like Colleen who join us on working groups, projects, committees, and help us to make decisions to make sure that we put the patients at the forefront of their health and their care. We ensure that patients retain control over their choices. We help patients make informed decisions and we support partnerships between patients, families, and healthcare providers. And if you wanna know more about patient and family experience of BC Cancer, the URL is at the bottom. Okay, BC Cancer, the main core supportive care services that we offer. Uh, nutrition, really important, so registered dietitians. Um, and it kind, I talk a little bit about scope. So dietitians at BC Cancer decrease, they work on with patients for decre decreased appetite, appetite, unwanted weight loss, dry mouth, taste changes, na nausea, bowel changes, but also dehydration and some life limiting nutrition issues. Patient and family counseling consists of registered clinical counselors and master level social workers. They can provide emotional support, but also practical and financial support. Like if I had cancer tomorrow, I would have a lot of practical concerns that I would need help with to make it to my therapies. 
uh, psychiatry, so psychiatrists are medical doctors who specialize in mental health, specifically depression, anxiety, personality changes, and psychiatric medications. Pain and symptom management and palliative care, um, it's a multidisciplinary team. So our PSMPC team is physicians, nurses, LPNs, social workers, clerical staff, the list goes on physiotherapist, not part of our core team you'll see, but they are part of PSMPC. And speech and language pathologists, which improve swallowing and communication difficulties that are secondary to a lot of cancer therapies. Okay, so in the work we do in BC Cancer, we like to think of two different opportunities currently. We want the patient to have more access to more services, more self-management resources, um, and more information about what is available. To date, some of the work that we've been doing is around groups. So online groups, in-person groups at the different centers, self-management resources like I mentioned. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out that we call the e-bulletin. And in the e-bulletin we use, it's basically like the recreation guide. It gives you all of the art therapy classes it might be running. It tells you about any of the support groups that might be happening. Our dietitians put in some information for self-management. And then we have a brilliant team of librarians at BC Cancer who have created library pathfinders. So you can look up anything if you want to know about all of the research happening at BC Cancer on cannabis and cancer side effects. You can contact our librarians and they will give you the pathfinders for that. The other piece that our team is really working on right now is connecting with the clinicians and providers across the province. So we can provide clinical resources for healthcare professionals. We have research publications, like some of the work that Andrea Knox and her team are working on right now. And we have something monthly that we call the Supportive Care Rounds. So it is a presentation on any innovative or new research or practice that we invite care providers and clinicians from all around the province to come and attend. And I see some familiar faces here of people who do attend rounds. So with all of that in mind, let's go back to my two questions. And obviously you can ask your own, but these are my agenda. I want to know, how can BC Cancer increase awareness amongst clinicians and providers? And I'm going to change this a little bit. It's more about supportive care specific to cancer care in BC. Because as we know, Minister Dix, the Ministry of Health, has said in the cancer plan, we want to see more end-to-end -end supportive care services and cancer care services. So how can we begin to have those conversations? And two, how can BC Cancer improve knowledge about the self-management resources that have been released by BC Cancer to patients and caregivers, specifically those who are treated in community oncology networks closer to home? I'm a registered social worker. I'm the coordinator of health services for the Ask Wellness Society. I moved to this beautiful land of Squatmkulu in 1991. I'm so grateful uh, to raise my family here, to learn, love, and work on this territory. So um, very grateful to be here today to share the voices of our people, some of the most vulnerable folks in Kamloops. So first, this is just an overview of health navigation. What's really cool about this is my contract is Population Health, um, one of the oldest contracts between Interior Health and the Ask Wellness Society. Started over 30 years ago as the AIDS Society of Kamloops. And so these are just a few of the things that we do. But most people in this room and the community know that we work with people that are marginalized. And the majority of the people that we work with are people that are substance users and they're unhoused often. We do have lots of different housing buildings and supports. We can provide supports to absolutely anybody, no matter where they are through outreach. 
So we will go to them. And so when I was compiling information for today, um, I reached out to the coordinators of the buildings. I reached out to the people with the lived experience and I came up with a few overarching themes. Thank you. But first I'd like to talk about my social location. So I'm a social worker. I went to TRU here and this is what some of the amazing professors highlighted for me. Something to be aware of is my social location. So I am a third generation European settler. Those are all my flags on the side there. I'm spiritual, but I'm assumed Christian. And what that means is that I don't wear any religious garments that would identify me otherwise. I'm a cisgendered female and I present that way. Um, I'm lower middle class. I am queer, but I'm in a heteronormative relationship. So I present that way and I'm able-bodied. And what social work teaches us is that the dominant culture is the majority of these things. So the only thing that is a roadblock for me would be the fact that I'm female. Otherwise, this world is meant for me. And that is, on to the next one. That's because of these things. So I know intersectionality has been thrown out there today, loving that. But when we look at equity and care, these are some barriers and these are the things that compile people to be who they are. So those are the list of all of them is a lot more than what I gave. And when we look at able-bodied individuals, I know that some people might think that that is a physical disability that you can see. But what I'm also talking about is substance use disorder. Substance use disorder and this opioid crisis is horrific. I think everybody knows that. But what you can find is that substance use disorder is not treated the same as any other disorder. And that can prevent people from accessing cancer care or health care in general. And so anyone that is a person of color or any of the other parts of this intersectionality is going to notice microaggressions. Now microaggressions are small, they are not outward it is not verbal um, the way i can describe this is someone following a person of color around a store to make sure they don't steal now if you can just imagine what that would feel like it's just a point of stress on you all the time so now everywhere you go you receive microaggressions now i don't think that these are always intentional i think that this is again coming from your social location how were you raised how were you taught it's not your fault, but it is your duty to witness that. So this is my theme coming from my social work perspective, going into a couple of cases. Now, these are two specific cases, but they also represent quite a few people, okay? So this is from our MASH program, Mental Health Adult Supportive Program. So I work very closely with this program. So. Both these individuals have the Access One diagnosis. That is a stipulation to be in the MASH program. So they're housed in low-income housing. These people were housed in the exact same building. They have access to all the same supports. Um, and that means transportation, referrals. But what you can see is that case number one did not access these services. Now we can't force it on people, but it's there. They had alcohol use disorder. And so when they go to an appointment, they smell of alcohol. And when they speak about their health concerns, they are treated that this is top, because this is what I can see, smell. My senses are telling me everything that you're going to talk about has to do with your alcohol use disorder. Um, this person would not let staff in. I think we all know these people. They're just, they've created a shell around them. It's their protection, right? Um, and then case number two is sort of the opposite in that way. They are welcoming, open. Um, so the person, case number one, unfortunately passed away from cancer with no treatment. Um, they complained about numerous things that led to cancer. Unfortunately, none of those were looked at and even just getting that person to talk to a doctor or anything was pulling teeth. So there's a couple factors, but that happened. 
Whereas in case number two, that person has used substances before, but they're not currently using them. Um, they luckily found, um, well, the doctor found the cancer early and they're in treatment currently. And so these two cases are showing what it can be like to be marginalized. They, they are the same people, essentially, just two different levels of care. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to go with, this can speak for a lot of people, but these are also two very specific cases. They are almost identical. And so, when I say that they have a strong sense of community, what I mean by that is that they are well-known and well-loved in the community by us, service providers, but also their own community, okay? And that has some drawbacks. So, it's, it's great for them and it's great for us because we can find them easily. They kind of hang out in the same places. So case number three and four both state that they have terminal cancer. I kind of know for a fact that I, no doctor has told them this. And I don't know where this really comes from. I don't know if it's a delusion. I don't know if it's attention seeking, and I say that in the kindest way. Rebecca Sanford in one of our um, mental health classes was speaking about if someone wants attention, give it to them. Like, why are we withholding attention from people? It's so silly. If someone's crying out for attention, why do we not give it to them? And so, um, unfortunately, case number three passed away. We're gonna have to go back. That's fine, thank you. Um, passed away, and so the reason why I brought up the sense of community is because every person in that street community thinks that they died of terminal cancer. Now this case number four, I would love to get this person in for care, screening, I called the hospital. They were like, I'll set you up with the oncology social worker. The supports are there, like the care is there, but it would literally be a full-time job for me to track down this person and try and bring them to care. They are very unwell, and I would have to sit with them the entire time, which is not doable, and we know that our hospital is overburdened. And so, we'll go to the next one, thanks. When I first started in health navigation, I was given a case by one of our leaders. I should have known how difficult it was going to be, but this individual um, was probably the biggest insight into what it is like to access healthcare in Kamloops. So this person had chronic leg wounds, uh, strep A and MRSA. And we, well, I, fought so hard to get this person to access care and we were getting there. But unfortunately, after a um, short stay in the hospital, they were unwilling to go back. And when I asked why, I said, let's go back. Let's start at wound care. We, we can do this. Like, I know we can do this. Give me three months and your life will be different. They just said, I can't go. They hurt me too much. And I could read between the lines. And I wrote something, and I will not read this entire document, but what I wrote in honor of this person that I brought to both MLAs was something rarely talked about is the intergenerational effects of poverty, criminality, and substance use in European settlers in Canada. When one hears of substance use, the mind goes to narcotics. However, alcohol is the most accepted and controlled substance in Canada. In fact, bars and clubs are just supervised consumption sites for alcohol misuse. I, I question why Kamloops citizens are up in arms over open substance use of illicit drugs, but pay no mind to citizens drinking openly to the point of intoxication across the street. Alcohol causes violence, health problems, sexualized violence, and destroys families. It is only because our Western society deems alcohol misuse acceptable that it is. Many other societies do not. European families have been consuming alcohol for generations and allow that to be the norm for all social gatherings. I know it is in my family. When we look at substance use from a sociological perspective, alcohol is accepted in some families, whereas other substances such as methamphetamines or opiates can be accepted in some families. Try to imagine what sort of a chance the child is given when a mother uses in vitro. Family members use illicit drugs. 
experience criminalization, have access to the substances by dealing, have unsafe visitors that assault the child on occasion, or even offer up the child for transactional purposes. The intention of these scenarios is to allow for the term choice to be highlighted. Did this child have a choice to use substances? Is this child expected to be a functioning member of society when they were never given an option for a healthy life? Thank you. So I looked to one of my favorite trauma people, uh, Besser van der Kolk, and this was a quote that came up. And so what I'm imploring everyone to do is to search for that child within every person that you see. And I know that this is a very welcoming room, but this is an overarching thing that I see is that they're stunted and we all know that. And there's only one reason why we need to look at why people use drugs. It works. That's it. It's the hug they didn't get. It's the warmth in the middle of the night. It takes the screaming away for about 20 minutes with fentanyl until we need to use it again. Thank you. So I found a study on adverse childhood experiences because all of these people that I spoke about all had adverse childhood experiences. Now I will spare you the details of what they share with me. It's horrific. And so I'll let you read it. I don't need to read along with you, but um, two decades, it's pretty amazing. And so it creates and generates a public health burden that could not exceed all other root causes. It's just trauma beneath all of this. And the unfortunate part and why I wrote this and brought it to the MLAs was because I wanted to advocate for trauma care to be added to MSP. Trauma care is a privileged, privileged thing. I know I access it, I have benefits. People on MSP can go to the chiropractor, they can get massages and osteopathy, that's great, but when the damage is in that child, in that soul within, I, I don't see it being very helpful. I, both MLAs told me the province would probably not go for it, but I'll keep trying. And so going back to Bessel van der Kolk, um, the ACE study has shown. So it is the single most preventative cause of a lot of these factors that are going to prevent someone to accessing care and then also um, to our physical health. I mean, there's empirical evidence to show that. Going. So what can be done? Um, I know this is a heavy topic. I appreciate you all um, paying attention. So what can be done is that recognition of your own social location. It is not your fault the way you were raised, but you are in control of that now. And what does that look like? A trauma-informed practice. And if that means looking at people that use substances or that come in, they're it's got that shell, you can see it. Please be mindful of that. It's not against you. I know you're trying to help. Okay, so then acknowledging that colonial practices still happen today. Okay, it's everywhere. This world is meant for people like me, and I'm grateful for that, but this is why I need to elevate the voices of the others. Um, we need parity for physical and mental health. We know that it is not happening. Physical health and mental health are separate entities, which is why the study is showing that it is impacting the physical health is so important to me. Um, the thing that's most important for me at Ask Wellness, I don't dress like this at Ask Wellness. Um, I dress very casually. Now I know a lot of people in the helping profession wear scrubs and things like this. I'm certainly not asking you to put on a backwards baseball cap or start wrapping. Uh, any sort of things like that. that's not going to work that's too far that other way but really you can just speak to people one thing the very first day that I started there was some people sitting on the ground and the outreach worker training me just knelt down like just removing that and so the clothing the way you speak all of these things are reducing barriers there's not a big difference between me personally and professionally because it works um, I've developed the most special relationships in my life by just being myself with these people because they can suss out who's not being real and they won't interact with you. So just be yourself. You don't have to be anybody else. Uh, do confront your personal biases because we all have them. And then as I was compiling this information about cancer care and the people that I know will never make it to that care or that I can't 
physically sit with them. I mean, in health navigation, we do do that, but I know we know ER times are about 10 to 12 to 15 hours. I can't sit there for that long. But it made me think about um, the opportunity to utilize peers. I have two peers on my team, and peers are some of our uh, greatest assets at Ask Wellness. Um, they've walked the walk, they've done the work, and now they're here to work with us to give that lived experience that we just don't always have. A lot of people do, but not everybody does. So I thought, could there be an opportunity to utilize peers, especially for ER visits? Is there a potential for Interior Health and Ask Wellness to collaborate, to have individuals that get it and they can, you know, because a big part of my job is also debriefing with people. Like, here's what I heard, because speaking medical jargon to somebody is just too much and this is a diagnosis and all these things, it's a lot. So I offer debriefing afterwards, maybe we're going for coffee or something like that. But this was um, an idea that I came up with. It may already exist, I don't think it does. Um, last time I took case number three into the hospital, um, I packed up their safe supply put in a stock, put in a little wheelchair that they were going in for. Um, I sat with them as long as I could. The triage nurse said, you need to stay this entire time. And I said, well, it's three o'clock and I have children. I can't do that. Uh, well, you should, because that's how this person will get the adequate care. And I said, okay. But unfortunately, a community member kind of came up and followed us up. And I just tagged him in and laughed. But what had happened was when they finally made it through, and this is the person that died, that everyone's going to think died from cancer, and I still don't know, and I'll never know. Um, when they got in and were seen by the doctor, the doctor just stated, if you're here for a prescription, don't bother. You're not going to get it from me. And the person left. And they never accessed care again. And so I don't know if this person had cancer or not but I would like to find out if case number four has cancer or not. So that will be my next journey. Um, I appreciate you all so much and allowing for me to speak for our most vulnerable citizens. <laughs>
guiding questions, and we also provided some recommendations that you will find next. So we wanted your opinion as well, your eyes, your thought as well, like what do you think, how relatable they are? Are they good, are they bad, or these are just useless, I have my own opinion. So what I would like, to, like you to do, you can just take your uh, handset or your laptop and go to menti.com and enter this code or you can scan the QR code as well. It's very easy, if you have any challenges, let me know. So it's very easy, go open your camera, scan this QR code, that will open a link. In that link, you will see slide. So once you are done, let me know, and then we will uh, take it from there. Yeah, so we go to the next slide now. And as we move forward, you will see your uh, uh, information on your handset will also change. So now you can see the introduction, a quick introduction, what we are discussing now. And uh, yeah, so you already know about the theme, you already know about the topic, what we are discussing today, and then we'll go to the next slide. So we started with the prevention and detection. So we have been talking about how to prevent, how to detect cancer and all of these things. So the question is, uh, uh, how can we effectively integrate advanced screening technologies to improve early detection rates, especially in un underrepresented communities? So there are five options on your screen, and you can just rate them. Which one you think is the most important solution? And you can just rate strongly agree to, to disagree. From one to five, you can just use that slider from left to right, and you can vote. And as you are voting, we can also see the result on the screen. Okay, so we can see some results. Okay, I see everyone is done. So yeah, 4.7% uh, is the, okay, 4.7 is the rating for development of community outreach program targeting underrepresented groups. Yes, and I think we have already seen the response during our group discussion as well. So we can move to the next slide now, which is again the second question, second important question, and with some recommendations. So this one is saying what strategies can be implemented to increase awareness and education about cancer prevention across diverse demographic groups. There are again five options, and you can quickly read them, read them, and you can just, on a scale of one to five, give your uh, uh, best answer, and then we can take them. Okay, so the last one, care addressing all aspects of breast cancer treatment, including psychological support. Got most of it, okay. Okay, so uh, now we can move to the next one, if you guys are done, yeah. So the third question, again, uh, again the, uh, under the prevention and detection is, uh, what role can digital health tools play in enhancing cancer prevention and detection? We have already talked about AI technology use of information sharing platforms. So that can also helpful, again, five answers for you. Uh, you can recommend which one you want uh, to score five or one. Okay, so now we are mostly done with this question. We can move to the next one. This one says, how can we ensure equitable access to prevention and screening services across different socioeconomic and geographic region? So now you can see that whatever discussion we have had so far, these are all covering. And again, you can have a rating scale against these five questions, five recommendations. Okay, advocating for policy changes to reduce healthcare inequalities. Okay, okay so now we can move to the next one. And uh, this is the last one under prevention and detection which says, what partnership can be established to bolster community-based cancer prevention efforts? There are five options. Again, based on the data analysis that we have done, you can rate. Okay, enhancing healthcare access for lower income and less educated affected person. Okay, that makes sense. So we can move to the next one now. And uh, this is an open-ended, uh, question for you, like if you agree or disagree with some of the recommendations that we have provided or if you have your own thought, you can write here. 
and we can use that as a as a feedback as well. So each question has four or five recommendations, but if you see I have more thoughts which you can collect from here, you can write and submit. Okay, possible to have a larger number of care providers to reduce wait time. Yes, okay. Providing navigation is the key to implementing effective supportive care for cancer patients and their families. Okay. Increasing access and use of cancer prevention and screening in rural marginalized area. Okay. okay so we got some responses. So this was uh, for prevention and detection. We got six responses, individual responses. We got your rating scale. Uh, we'll move to the next one now. Uh, quickly, and this is about the treatment and supportive services. In the same way that we did for prevention and detection, you will have one question on your screen, and uh, this was about treatment and supportive care. So the question is, what are the current barriers to accessing cancer treatment and how can they be addressed? One is effectively address the economic burden, and there are one, two, three, four, five options, six options actually in this one based on the patient's voice and data analysis, these are the recommendations. You can rate again and submit. Okay, so collaboration with pharmaceutical companies for affordable innovative treatments. Okay, that got five, okay. Okay, so now we can move to the next one. Uh, the second set of question under treatment and supportive service is uh, what role can community support groups play in enhancing the quality of life for cancer patients? Leveraging machine learning and predictive analytics. That's, a, that's quite impactful, actually. But you can rate and you can submit. Okay, so providing support to people with diverse cultural practices to meet psychosocial and educational needs. Now we can move to the next set of questions, if you guys are done. So the second question under treatment and supportive service is, how can we enhance the integration of palliative care into cancer treatment plan. Again, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven options here. Seven recommendations, you can rate them. Developing personalized survivorship and providing supportive care. Okay. And under treatment supportive service, the third question is what innovative treatment options such as precision medicine immunotherapy, et cetera, can be more accessible. Leveraging telehealth solution or developing health literacy. Again, you have six recommendations. Please provide your rating. Okay, so creating cancer innovation with interdisciplinary healthcare professional to generate informed contextual practice, got 4.7, okay. Okay, so now we can quickly move to the third set of question under treatment and uh, supportive services, which is about the mental health support. How can mental, mental health support be effectively incorporated into cancer care? There are five or six recommendations. recognize the distinct needs of affected person based on their living situation, okay, and introducing culturally sensitive care practice for indigenous and other minority groups, okay. Okay, so we can move to the next slide now. Uh, again, the open-ended comment box for you. If you want to share your thoughts, you can share here. Okay, the sooner the support is provided, the better, even if people are not ready to receive, at least the option is there when they are ready. Okay, good, that's very nice. Team-based approach and increasing benefit on MSP and extended health benefit and funding people. Okay, core services, both public and private, need to be identified for patient without endorsement, allowing people to be aware of all treatment options. Okay, so we will include these recommendations as well. Okay, so now we got the responses. We can move to the next one, which is primary care and community support care, which is the last one. 
and we again have a few options, recommendations in the same way. So the first question under primary care and community support care is how can primary care be strengthened to play a more active role in cancer care? Training and resources for primary care providers or support programs. Again, you have six recommendations. You can provide your rating. Support program and financial assistance for caregivers, training and resources for primary care providers in cancer management. Okay. Okay, the third one is establishing policies and investing in technology infrastructure to ensure integration. Okay, that also we have discussed. Okay, so with your uh, rating scale, we can move to the next one under primary care and community support. So the next question under this one is, what are effective models for community-based cancer care? Again, you have five, six rate recommendations. Uh, you can provide your rating. This is the third question under this one. So we have your responses under primary care and community support. So we will go to the open-ended slide because we are running short of time. So uh, we will go to the next one, next one, next one. And you can provide your thoughts and additional recommendations for primary care and community support care if you think that there are recommendations that you think should be included in the report or the assessment. You can write your comments. Okay. So I like the idea of a hub in Kamloops and think we might want to investigate municipal involvement. Community care, community cancer supportive center for practice. Okay. Appreciation for Melba and Florian. Okay. Can something like 811 broker info, workshop for primary caregivers who never experienced caring for someone without cancer. Okay. Thank you so much for your responses and your time. So we are done with this exercise, and I will hand it over to Melba and Ashwin now. Thank you. I know they have a lot of closing ceremonies, but I just wanted to have an opportunity to say thank you. In terms of including, I had an opportunity to be part of a little bit in the beginning. I'd hope to be able to participate a little bit more. But I know that every time I popped up, the energy in the room was fantastic in terms of the kinds of conversations. And I just, I think, listening to it in the morning and hearing how important this work is, um, you know, from the various perspectives, I was really impressed with the diversity of groups that are in the room today and the, the perspectives that are presented. And when I think about how we're going to make things better for those we serve, our patients and our families and our communities, it really is through those community partnerships. So I want to take this opportunity to thank both um, Dr. Souza and Dr. Baer for hosting this summit. You know, TRU School of Nursing is delighted to be a partner in this, that both are very valued colleagues. And I think when we do this work, it is so consistent with the mission and the vision of TRU as well as the School of Nursing. You know, as nurses, we, we care for people, we work with people and with communities. And it is your input and your ideas that will generate the evidence that we need to move the agenda forward. So thank you, all of you, for being here. I know that it's been a full day. I know it's been a busy day. And we're really, really grateful to have all of your perspectives, students, and the students. Well, I was going to get to them. And I think it's been really amazing to see, again, when you have an event like this, you see the hours and, in fact, months and years of work that happens, right? Because through the studies, when you kind of look at getting those partnerships going, and having all of our students and research assistants and our students involved in that is, again, a really wonderful opportunity for you to move forward to your perspectives. Mm -hmm. But also, as you grow in your career, I hope that this gives you a really solid grounding for how important the partnerships are, how important it is to hear the voices and the perspectives and the expertise that different people bring. We all bring different expertise, and it's very easy to say, yes, this is, this is you know, it's funny, I love, I, I love doing a lot of work in the cross-cultural diversity work from the very beginning. And one of the things I always said is somehow, when health professionals have it, we say it's knowledge and evidence-based. And when it would come from patients and families, we'd say, oh, yes, those are your beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I would say, no, actually, that is your knowledge and expertise, right? Mm -hmm. um, all evidence, to some extent, is flawed. Nothing is perfect, and all evidence is informed. And so as we learn more about the different perspectives, the different knowledge to bring in, and also different ways of knowing that comes to the table, it is really, really critical. So thank you for coming.
And I think when this kind of work happens, it's amazing for our students. I know that we don't have a lot of our nursing students in the room today, but I know this is being uh, recorded, that we have an opportunity to share. And just knowing that this is happening and just being able to talk about it, I think really sets the stage for emphasizing the importance of this work and the importance of the partnership. I think, you know, we, we just, I'm just thrilled that we were able to host it here. We <coughs> moved into this lovely building three years ago now, July, during COVID, July of 2020. And part of the whole design was always to think about how do we use this beautiful space to bring community in? to create that kind of dialogue. For some, it's like this on an ongoing basis. And so I look forward to the next one since we said declared it. This is now a thing, right? <coughs> it's a thing. Absolutely a thing. So once again, I'm not going to, you know, you've had a long day and lots of ideas buzzing. So thank you for letting me have a few moments to say express my gratitude to all of you. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all at the second annual summit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.